Hi, I'm Amy Walter. This is a special edition of the Cook Political Report podcast, The Odd Years, a political podcast designed for the off years, literally the odd numbered years where there are no scheduled federal elections. On March 31st, we invited our premium subscribers to join us for an exclusive event in Washington, D.C., which we co-hosted with National Journal. Following the news of former President Trump's indictment in New York, National Journal's editor-in-chief Jeff Dufour and the White House reporter George Condon and I shared our thoughts on the impact that indictment would have on the 2024 race. We also discussed the challenges for Biden's re-election, including issues surrounding the economy and the likelihood of a debt ceiling resolution. So without further ado, here's our talk. Morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Jeff Dufour. I'm the editor-in-chief of National Journal. Joining me today, um, very little introduction, but I'm going to give them one anyway. Uh, Amy Walter, publisher and editor-in-chief of Cook Political Report. Uh, you probably know her from Meet the Press, PBS. Uh, you may even know her from National Journal, where she was the editor of Hotline from 2007 to and um, National Journal's White House correspondent, George Condon. Uh, George has covered, interviewed, interviewed nine presidents, correct? Yeah. Ten presidents, I'm sorry, ten presidents, uh, and reported from 88 countries. He has been a past, pre or he is a past president of both the Gridiron Club and the White House Correspondents Association. So um, what happened last night? I was just telling Amy I was at the Nationals game and I was going from there to my son's baseball practice. I coach and on the way I got a text from one of the hosts at WTOP and he said, you want to come on and do five minutes about the indictment? I said, what, what indictment? Is it Bragg or was it somebody else? Said, no, it was Bragg. Oh, okay. I guess I have to go on Twitter during my son's baseball practice now. Um, so. Well, initial thoughts on this from the two of you. Um, everyone, Republicans, Democrats, everybody sort of retreated into their predictable corners now. Amy? <laughs> I'm going to channel Don inner, my inner Donald Rumsfeld for a minute about known knowns, known unknowns. Unknown unknowns. We're deep in the known unknown category right now. We know there's an indictment. We expect to see the former president going up to New York next week. We expect this process. Well, actually, we don't even know. We don't know what this process is going to look like as the part of the unknown. During that, what will that be like, that actual event of a former president of the United States going and getting arraigned? In front of, will it be a big crowd? Will there be protests? Will there be violence? Right? Those are some of the unknowns. We obviously still don't know what the indictments are. So that gets unsealed at some point, Tuesday, potentially, theoretically. Um, we don't know if this is... Um, so... Those are the things, those are the unknowns of that, uh, many of the unknowns. The known is, as you said, predictably, everybody going into their corners, Republicans rallying around the president. What does that actually mean? Does this, I've seen a lot of hot takes. This means that the nomination is wrapped up for Donald Trump. Really? It is? Okay. I'm glad everybody already knows that. We can just fast forward ourselves through 2024. We do know that, yes. This is going to be a moment where Republicans feeling as if a political case been being brought against Donald Trump once again, the, the continuing frustration that many Republicans have about what they see as a political system designed to keep Donald Trump away from the Oval Office. But does that hold continuously for the next how many more months before we get to the nomination? More important, I think a lot of voters can hold two thoughts at the same time. One is, yes, this is an incredibly political um, decision by the Manhattan prosecutor. 
And I'm also at the same time worried that Donald Trump as a candidate has been damaged for the general election. And that will have an impact on how I vote. That's channeling a Republican voter. Um, what does it mean for uh, the what does it mean too when it's the beginning? I know there's a lot of conversation right now about this was the wrong case to bring. It would be better to see the the first indictment of Donald Trump just for from a political standpoint to be about January 6th or to be about the case in Georgia. But those could also still happen. This is not the beginning of the end. So we still have a lot of unknowns at this point in time. I think fundamentally um, what we have is, in this era of Trump, we, what we've had continuously, which is a series of seemingly seismic events that don't move the needle all that much in terms of our partisanship, the way people perceive the president, but it could absolutely have an impact on how the 2024 race shapes up, especially in the Republican primary. Yeah, I, I would just also add, you're right. We need to be humble uh, in our predictions on, on Donald Trump. Uh, you know, going back to, uh, oh, calling Mexicans rapists, his candidacy is over. And uh, access Hollywood, his candidacy is over. So let's, let's be a little more humble about predictions and just talk about what we know. One thing we do know is how Donald Trump is going to respond to this. And he's going to respond politically. Uh, and he already has uh, what he did after impeachment uh, and after the Russia investigation. He's, uh, he's already been calling uh, members of Congress, you know, investigate uh, Bragg and, uh, you know, stop this investigation. He's going to learn that this isn't a political operation like uh, impeachment or like the Russia investigation. He had Mitch McConnell guiding the impeachment trial in both cases. He has no control over, over the judge. Attacking the judge is not going to pay off for him. You cannot have the political response. And that's what we've seen from him uh, so far. Uh, and I, I think he's going to learn that that isn't going to work. Can you talk a little about can you talk a little about also about what the White House's response has been or lack of response so well, far it, and I, what I, it might be? I, I brought the uh, the official White House response here from uh, the, uh, the the president this morning as he was on the South Lawn uh, leaving uh, for Andrews. Uh, he had six words. I have no comment on Trump. And that's the smartest thing they could do. A, a it's right on policy. And they have a longstanding policy of not responding to ongoing legal processes. But it's also very smart uh, politically. I mean, you have a split screen uh, today. Uh, just before this started, the president arrived in Mississippi. He is going to be seen today uh, in a Republican state uh, showing empathy for people who've lost their homes uh, and promising. The government will be there for him. And when he gets back to the White House, he'll be talking about jobs and the inflation report. That's his side of the screen. The other side of the screen is Donald Trump talking about whether or not he's going to be handcuffed and what the process will be. That's a split screen the White House can live with. And they have told all the aides, do not talk about Trump. I don't think you'll see the discipline on the Hill. Democrats will be talking about it. But I, I do think, maybe naively, that you'll see that kind of discipline, at least for a while, at the White House. So we can get into a little more of the specifics there in the Q&A, but more broadly on the 2024 race, and then we'll get down to some down-ballot stuff later. Um, can we learn anything from the horse race polls that we've seen so far? We're constantly warned that the horse race poll, this is much too early to put any stock in this, but we see that DeSantis continues to be talked about and continues to be elevated as the possible uh, foil to Trump, yet 
Trump's numbers continue to get better and better. Right. How much stock do we put in that? Right. I don't put a ton of stock in that. So I went back and looked at this point in 2008. So the spring, actually 2007. So the spring of 2007, uh, Hillary Clinton was up anywhere from like eight to 20 points over a guy named Barack Obama. Uh, Rudy Giuliani was far and away the Republican front runner. Uh, in 2016, as we know, at this point, it was a guy named Jeb with an exclamation point and uh, Scott Walker, who were vying for the uh, front runner status. Trump was basically at one or three percent somewhere in there. Um, Mitt Romney was ahead at this point, um, but he would go like this and then come down as a new person would get in the race and get a little bit of a bump. So. I'm very, very wary. My other claim to fame, um, besides being at the hotline, was I served as a political director of ABC News. And in 2012, when I was putting reporters and embedding them into campaigns, one of our strongest reporters, I said, well, I, I got to put her on a campaign that's going to go all the way, right? Or at least close to all the way. And I said, listen, I'm putting you on a really good race. I think, I think this... This is going to be good for you uh, and your, the rest of your career because you're going to have a front seat to this process. I'm putting you on Rick Perry's campaign. That guy, I think this is going to be big. Uh, six weeks later, she was not on the trail anymore. So i very, very skeptical. But we do know what we can know are the following things. Donald Trump remains the front runner because he has a 100% name ID and he's well liked within the party. Uh, so we start there. Now, you can look at the polls right now and say, based on those things, 100% name ID, former president, well liked, should he be higher? Right? Should he be at 85%? Right? So being up by 10 or 20 or whatever it is in the latest polls, that's not that great. Um, you can also, though, look at it, and I think uh, this was Whit Ayers polling, uh, Republican pollster did this for the Bulwark recently, looking at Republican primary voters and sort of putting them in buckets. And I think this makes a whole lot of sense. Um, Trump, ride or die voters, so those folks who are going to be with him, literally indicted in jail, doesn't matter with him. Let's call that 35 percent. Maybe it can bump up to 40, but let's call it 35 percent, 10 to 15 percent, never Trumpers. The rest, let's call them alternative curious, right? They're like, I don't know, maybe with the right person. I could be, I'm curious. Um, they like Trump. You've heard these, if you've listened in to some of these focus groups, what they say constantly is same stuff. Trump, greatest president of my lifetime great policies. He's being railroaded. The establishment hates him. The swamp hates him. But oh, I don't know. Like, I think because the establishment wants him to lose and the swamp hates him, they're going to take him down. Maybe we can find someone else like that. DeSantis seems like a good alternative, like Trump, but more disciplined than Trump. So they are open to this. Now, there's an argument going around though, that DeSantis is drop is because he's being attacked by the former president. Okay. I think what we saw from December to, let's say, February, maybe even not, this November to January, let's put that time frame. What were we talking about in the media? Midterm elections, a lot better for Democrats than we expected. Great for a guy named Ron DeSantis really bad for a guy named Donald Trump. That was the media narrative. We don't talk about that much anymore. Again, in the broader narrative, all of us dorks talk about this all the time. M normal people, and I love you all, but you're not normal because you're here. They are not thinking about this, right? They're not seeing any of this. This isn't in the, this isn't a main sort of narrative now. So they don't really know that much about Ron DeSantis. They like the theory of Ron DeSantis. They know who Donald Trump is. And so we're kind of going back to where we've always been. I think we're just kind of reverting to the mean. People go back to Donald Trump when they don't see much from the alternative. Now, the only time that those voters, well, not the only time, 
The first chance these voters will get to see what an alternative looks like comes when he announces, which we assume will be sometime early summer. So, okay, get your first real look at what, not just who is Ron DeSantis, but what's his message? What is he saying about Trump? What is he saying about being president? All these things. And then the debate in August. I didn't realize this. I mean, we knew what a big deal the debate was in 2015. Remember that first Fox debate when Trump got in a fight with Megyn Kelly? Another point where you yeah. bring up that everybody thought that was going to kill him because he attacked this woman. Um, obviously, that was also wrong. But um, 24 million people watched that. And they didn't. They watched it because they're like, who is this Trump guy? Let's see what he can do. I think we're going to get... Even more than that, everybody knows what Trump's like, but they don't know who these other people are like. And that is really and truly, if you think, where's the make or break moment for somebody not named Donald Trump, but especially DeSantis, it's it's August. You agree? Disagree? You have any thoughts? Well, when people bring up the electability argument, I revert back to two points. Number one is that the electability argument carried very little water in many key states in 2022. Um, in, I mean, Republicans essentially flushed oh, uh, no. a governor, governor's race and a Senate race in both Pennsylvania and in Arizona uh, by nominating the wrong candidates. And that those candidates were motivated by and anointed by the base. Yep. I also look at, I did see one polling question on this that asked it specifically, CNN maybe two, three weeks ago, asked Republican voters, are you more interested in backing someone who agrees with you on the issues or someone who you think is electable and can be Joe Biden? 59% said someone who agrees with me and 41% said someone who's electable. Um, now, Trump is not fundamentally a policy guy. That's not what it's about. But agreeing with me means somebody who, who speaks for me to, yeah. to a lot and, of these people. And that's, and that's, where that's I more think important. DeSantis has to be very clear. It's not just this, um, I can win and he can't. It has to be, but which is the balancing act that he's trying to have, right? Which is, I can give you everything you want, right? It's like, you can eat all the food you want and never gain weight. I give you that. I'm young. I'm aggressive. I'm a lot like Trump and who my enemies are and where my policy focus is going to be but I'm going to be more disciplined. I'm going to be less focused on my past grievances and more focused on you. So he can't just run as the, I'm the anti-Trump. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. L let me just add on the polls. And uh, I, I was just talking to President Howard Dean the other day, and he, he thinks they're good. But uh, uh, there is one thing that I do believe in the polls, and I'm going to sort of make that point by taking a poll here, you look like a really good focus group uh, to me. You're all you're all registered voters. Uh, so let me ask for a show of hands of all the people who are really excited, really enthusiastic about having a rematch of the 2020 campaign, Biden Trump. We have one hand. Okay. For you. Okay. Okay. That that is that is showing up in the uh, in the polls. Uh, I, I, uh, the post ABC poll showed 58% of Democrats want somebody other than Biden. 49% of Republicans want somebody other than, than Trump. Uh, and I, I believe that, that polling, because to me, there are only two numbers that matter, uh, 86 and 82. And that's the ages that the president would be if, if one of these guys or the other wins. Uh, I, I told Jeff, I, I made a promise uh, to my wife uh, about six years ago, I would never vote for a candidate again who was older than me. And then both parties nominated candidates older than me. So I guess uh, as a baby boomer, I'm stuck uh, uh, voting for older people. But uh, we may never get our Gen X candidate. I know. We may just skip over Gen X entirely. I mean, we can have an entire conversation about that, as you know, my feelings about my the greatest generation being overlooked <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you um i want to get into some of the issues that are gonna animate this race and as as a way to do that 
George, I wanted to ask you, you've uncovered in the last couple of weeks, two quotes, one from Biden and one from Trump that I think almost perfectly encapsulate their respective political positions and their, and the dynamics of their, uh, their races. Well, uh, the, the one was Biden last week uh, in Las Vegas. It was talking about uh, his tax positions and so on. And he, he showed a self-awareness and he said, he said, you know, my position's a hell of a lot more popular than I am. Uh, and it's, it's a rare president or a rare candidate who actually understands that. I mean, Trump spent uh, four years telling us repeatedly that he was more popular than any president, including Abraham Lincoln. He, he once said that, that he had checked the polls and that uh, he was polling better than Lincoln, uh, which sort of surprised Gallup, who didn't, wasn't doing much polling uh, during the 1860s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and would get very angry if we ever suggested that anybody in the country didn't like him. Uh, but Biden is very, uh, very aware of, of where he stands. And he is not talking about himself. He's talking about uh, the issues when he's out there. And the, the, the other uh, quote that you mentioned uh, was, a, was a, um, a, an, an attack that Trump made on DeSantis last week. And I, I have to quote this. Uh, you know, if, if there's an award for presidential chutzpah, uh, this has got to be it. Uh, you know, this was after his uh, rally in Waco, which you could basically summarize as 2020 election, January 6, 2020 election, me, January 6, 2020 election. Um, and uh, he, the next day, was furious that DeSantis called Vladimir Putin a war criminal. And uh, Trump felt he had to come to the defense of uh, of Putin and attack DeSantis. So he said, I, I, I've got to do this exact. He said, DeSantis shows a lack of depth, a lack of seriousness, and a lack of sophistication on the subtleties and complexities of foreign policy. This is not the time for on-the-job training. You know, I, I, I spent four years covering President Trump's foreign policy, and Never once did sophistication, subtleties, or complexities, uh, those words didn't make any of my stories. And if I had put them in, Jeff would have edited them out. Uh, but it, it tells you the, the, the great self-awareness by the, by the president and the complete and utter lack of self-awareness uh, by the uh, former president. So as we move into some of these issues, like foreign policy, economy, et cetera. Um, Amy, Biden has been very clearly in the last month or so starting to protect his right flank on energy, approving the drilling in Alaska, um, immigration, sending more border patrol up to Canada and, and revising the asylum policy. And then on crime, of course, with the D.C., um, overturning the D.C. law, signing that. Um, is it, is any of that enough? Will it matter or will the attacks be the same regardless of, of what he does on that front? Yeah, I think all of this matters in terms of framing the narrative, um, as we go into 2024, but of course, what are we going to be talking about mm -hmm. in 2024 that goes in again to my Donald Rumsfeld known unknowns, whether it's the economy or immigration or what Donald Trump wants to talk about if he's the nominee or whoever the other nominee is, what they want to be uh, focused on. I think George made a really good point, which is that the policies themselves popular, but Biden not. Why, why is that the case? Some of it is just our partisanship. We know this, but um, it's becoming even more apparent that opinions about the economy are as tied to your partisanship as they are anything else. Uh, and it, it had been there. Uh, the, the Michigan Consumer Survey has been looking at partisanship and, um, and opinions about the economy for years now. And there'd always been an appreciable gap between 
okay, if you're a Democrat and a Republican's in office uh, as the president, you feel more pessimistic about the economy. If your party's in charge, you feel more optimistic. So there's always been like a 20-point gap there, partisan gap. When Trump came into office, it ballooned to a 55-point gap. And I don't know where we are now because they need to rerun these numbers. So I would like to see where we are with Biden, whether that was a unique Trump thing or whether we're there permanently. The fact that in 2022, you could have a president with approval ratings as low as his were, 40-year high inflation, and Biden's economic approval ratings as low as they were and still do relatively well was quite, quite telling of the people who said that the economy was not so good, so they didn't think it was terrible, but they didn't think it was good, they voted for Democrats by 27 points. So, you know, the things that we normally use as our guideposts for elections, opinions about the president, his handling of the economy, handling of the presidency, right direction, wrong track, they're helpful, but they don't tell us everything. And in fact, I feel like they tell us less now than we knew uh, but in the in the older days, um, Trump's success um, in 2020 was that he came as close as he did, given how low his approval rating was. Um, and so I don't think we're going to be back to a place where we were in the old days, where if you're not at 50 or above, you're going to lose the White House. The only question is how low can you be and still be able to win a um, an electoral college victory. There's a real dichotomy there. I, I just saw his numbers on the economy in right around the Afghanistan pullout, even his numbers on the economy were still pretty close to 50, 50, 46, 54, something like that. Um, now, a year and a half later, with inflation getting better and with unemployment still rock bottom and the consumer confidence numbers ticking back up, um, his approvals on the economy have gotten much, much worse. Even as the, even as the indicators have gotten better, he's down to, I think, 34 approval yeah. on the economy now, much worse than his overall approval. Well, and the day-to-day -day life expenses, especially food, have not gone down. Right. And so it, you can be told over and over again, the economy is getting better. But you're paying $7 but you're paying for eggs more, regardless. Right. Or yeah. whatever it is that you're buying that is not back to its normal yeah. level. Um, I, I would just add, if you look at the issues that are going to be at play in this campaign, I really don't think it's going to be specific issues, uh, you know, uh, whether it's health care, uh, jobs or anything. It's it's going to be bigger things than that. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, uh, drama versus stability and, uh, and, and sort of uh, normalcy versus crazy again. And that... That was sort of what we saw in 2020, and I think we'll see that again if we have these same two candidates. And the, the second point I would make is uh, a, a lesson from Bill Clinton. Uh, I, I remember I had a conversation with Bill Clinton once after the uh, 92 uh, election, and he, and he sort of surprised me. He said, you know, Bush could have beaten me. Uh, he said, I kept waiting for him to talk about the future, to talk about what are you, he was going to do in the second term. Yeah. And he said, that would have been a real problem for me. And so luckily, he just kept talking about what he did in the first term. Yeah. Uh, and he said, that I could deal with. And then we saw that again in when he ran for his second term. Uh, Bob Dole made the mistake in his campaign, his convention speech of saying, I want to be a bridge to the World War II generation. And by and Clinton seized on that. And those of us covering the campaign got so tired oh, of hearing this. But he promised to be a bridge to the 21st century. And it just, it was a devastating uh, thing for Dole. Dole could not uh, in any way talk about the future and he could not overcome that. So that's, Biden, I think, is going to be smart enough to talk about what he's going to do in a second term. Um, you have to defend what you did in the first, but he'll talk about that. And if, if Trump still keeps talking about January 6th, 2020, and my, and I was the greatest, it, it's not a good match. 
Uh, George, I want to ask you about a quote from, of all people, Laura Ingram. I got it here. She asked, we talked about this. She asked in a tweet, quote, are Republicans planning to answer Biden's arguments or do they let, plan to let him be the only politician to talk about the economy in this campaign? She's got a point there, right? Oh, and the fact that it's coming from Laura Ingram, she doesn't want Joe Biden yeah. to win. And it's driving her crazy and a lot of Republicans crazy that you know, Joe Biden is out there not talking about culture wars. You, you rarely hear him get into that. I mean, they have a, they have a resolution today on uh, transgender, but you do not hear the president talking about that. You don't hear him talking about school boards. Uh, he is sticking to jobs, health care, the economy. Uh, he just put out something today after the uh, CPI report came out this morning. Uh, and, and he's being very dis. I never thought I'd use the word discipline with Joe Biden, <laughs> having covered his 88 campaign and covered him and, uh, you know, seen him in the Senate. Uh, but he is being disciplined uh, on the message on that. And the other side is not. So uh, Laura Ingram, from a Republican standpoint, it's a it's a good concern. And then, Amy, if. If Democrats have real vulnerabilities, we saw these exploited more in 2020 than in 2022, but real vulnerabilities on Green New Deal, defund the police, Medicare for all, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Republicans also have their own vulnerabilities, which we saw very much in the last cycle on abortion, January 6th, et cetera. Um, are the leaders doing enough, or the answer is embedded in the question, are the leaders doing anything to embat uh, to, to combat those charges of extremism. Right. That, that they're too far off. So uh, it was interesting. I had, a, I had a conversation with two Republican strategists who did a lot of work in Arizona last year, and uh, their frustration with the way in which the Republican Party handled or did not handle the abortion issue is they had just, you know, whenever you hope something's going to go away, that's not a good way to, um, to deal with something. And that they had sort of convinced themselves that the economy was more important and that abortion was second because that's how it showed up in the polls. But when you looked at those people, like I said, the ones who said the economy's not great but still voted for Democrats, a lot of those folks, when you ask them, those the economy's not so great, but then voted for Democrat, if you followed up as the Navigator polling did and say, OK, well, what was your number one issue? It was abortion and protecting democracy. And inflation was up there, too. But it wasn't as high as it was in the sort of traditional, what's my top top issue? So um, that issue is not going away. They, I, I said, well, do you think it's going to be as important in the next election? It's, you know, uh, Dobbs won't be as fresh. And they said, uh, remember, Roe v. Wade was a 50-year president, right? It was we had been fighting about Roe v. Wade for 50 years. Do you think that next year, just because Dobbs is two years old, we're not talking about it? We're seeing ballot initiatives. We have a state Supreme Court um, race in Wisconsin next week where abortion is at the center of that conversation. So this is going to still be there and there's not an answer. Um, and then it's the kind of candidates my colleague Jessica Taylor and Dave Wasserman are covering this in great detail. But the kind of candidates that Republicans nominate is going to matter a lot. Now, there's talk about, well, we're going to do a better job of vetting our candidates and getting the right candidates. Anybody who's worked in politics knows you don't just go in and you're like, hey, this is our candidate. This one is crazy. Don't pick that one. Doesn't doesn't always work that well. And, and, and it's and it's hard to have inflation as the issue if the other side isn't talking about what they would do about it. If you're not talking about it on the stump and, you know, I, they weren't talking and the president, the former president is not talking about it. One of the key points I thought that came out of the, uh, the exit polls is that too many people focused on what is your most important issue and only looking at that versus what are your most, most important issues, plural. A lot of voters, at least this time around, wanted to walk and chew gum at the same time. They cared about 
inflation, but they also cared about abortion very much, or they cared about health care or a multiplicity of issues. It wasn't just a binary you care about the economy or you care about something else. Speaking of these issues, I don't want to ignore Congress <laughs> yeah. too much. Uh, but there is a there is another branch of government. There are two, actually. Really? Yes. Um, the map for Senate Democrats is dreadful. We knew that it was dreadful going in, and now we see the initial Cook ratings uh, for the cycle. Uh, there are three toss-up races. All of them are held by Democrats. There are, I believe, six. Lean races, six or lean five. races, all of them are held by Democrats. Um, there is only on either side one likely race, and that is Rick Scott in Florida. And given what we saw in Florida last time, uh, I don't think Democrats can put too much stock in that. Yeah. Um, however, on the Democrat, I'm sorry, on the House side, uh, the map is much more even than it was last time. Yep. The, um, I think the final ratings, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the toss ups were 25 Democrat held, nine Republican held. And right now, Dave, yes. Ballpark, okay. Cool. And now it's pretty close to 50 50. It's 11 to nine. The toss ups are also not quite 50 50, but they're really close to 50 50. Um, let me ask it this way Could we see. Both chambers flip back this year. Sure, why not? <laughs> why not? It's been what it was. It's all we've done is flip. Yeah. If 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 the Senate does flip, by the way, and and Charlie Cook was the first one who noted this, at least that I saw. Um, we would have a fifth for the first time in history. Five consecutive presidents lose their House and Senate majorities during their tenure. Um, so it, this is the norm, and obviously the Senate, the map is the whole ball is the whole ball game. To me, for the Senate, it comes down to uh, questions about, we, as we discussed, candidate quality, um, but also uh, retirements. And um, I think for Democrats, there are folks that they would like to see retire, and those that they would not like to see retire. Kirsten Cinema, I don't know that they would be upset if she were to say. You know what? It's been fun. I'm gonna I'm not gonna go do this anymore. Um, and Democrats get sort of a clean, easy. Not it's not that it's an easy race, but the math is easier with one Democrat, especially if Republicans nominate, say, Carrie Lake as as uh, their uh, nominee in that race. They would love to see Joe Manchin stick around. Now he still has a very very tough race, especially Jim Justice is probably coming in at any time soon. And by the way, if you're going to campaign uh, with a dog named Baby Doll, Baby baby Dog, oh, uh, that can't hurt. So maybe Manchin needs to do that. So one they'd like to see stay to at least maybe see if that can hold that fight one go. But just West Virginia alone Democrats don't win the White House. You lose West Virginia and lose the White House. You lose control of the Senate. Yeah. yeah. Another data point is that going back to 2013 in five consecutive cycles, the quote unquote realignment has never lasted more than one cycle, which is to yeah. say the House, the Senate or the presidency has or or more has flipped in every cycle going back to 2013. So there's a lot of instability. There is arguably, we, I mean, we've seen political setups, political dynamics that were much more stable when one party had a 60 or 80 seat majority. Or even House. when they had a five. I mean, I covered the 2000 um, House race. Republicans had a five seat majority. Remember that was right. Dick Gebhardt's drive to five. Um, he was finally going to get to be speaker, right? After all this time, they just needed five seats. They got one. Um, so the uh, it's not just that they had bigger margins. It's that the volatility um, was not as dramatic because the House was not as, right? The House is so well sorted now 
that it is harder than ever to find those districts. And then every once in a while, you get you catch a break when you have a guy who's apparently the, what is he, Super Bowl MVP, Academy Award winning, Nobel physicist George Santos. Yes. Um, helps you out. But sexiest man alive. Yes. All of that. Yeah. yeah. Got got it all. Um, shall we move to some questions? Yeah. Do you want me to ask you a question? Oh, sure. Ask okay. me a question. I want to ask about I want to ask you a question and then we'll open it up about Congress specifically. Yep. Um a few weeks ago I was at a, an event and the, the talk amongst people who are in this business was about the debt ceiling. And one person said, look, the debt ceiling, it's kind of like a kidney stone, okay? You're going to pass it. It's just a question of how painful it's going to be. And I'm wondering now, are we going to pass that kidney stone? Um, and if so, just how bad is it going to be? They're, they're going to pass it, but the question is, when? Uh, will they will they do it before the the deadline that that the Treasury Department sets or not? Which is to say, does it become a fiscal emergency or not? They've got the problem they have is that because of the deadline the Treasury gave them, it's no longer uh, they can't do the budget and the debt ceiling at the exact same time. The budget is September thirtieth. The debt ceiling is probably depending on how creative they want to get with their accounting and moving money around July, maybe into August. So if they're going to default, that could happen before they ever deal with the budget. Um, my take on the GOP House is that, A, there are enough members in there that want to use the debt ceiling to make a point. And McCarthy has made promises to almost all of them uh, up to include uh, up to and including you know giving Tucker Carlson the January 6th footage he's made all these promises many of which we knew about many of which we didn't know about and we're only going to find out about um, there's a huge percentage of their, of his caucus may, probably not 50 percent but a lot of them who are more than happy to risk a default to make this point we already had last week the um, Ways and Means Committee pass this bill to uh, essentially rank which bills we're going to pay first if we end up defaulting. Uh, that's not going to go anywhere in the Senate, but it shows how serious they are in the House about this posture. So I am not confident at all that that this is going to be taken care of before it's a crisis, before we see the Dow drop 5,000 points, and before we're, you know, uh, people's foreign governments start pulling their money out and everything else, and then it becomes a real problem, and then they act. I'm not confident there, because I only see the political will to, to prevent it on one side. The other side, I'm not convinced they have the political will yet. And, and at the White House, they are determined to force the Republicans to specify right. what cuts you want to make. Uh, to, uh, because if you want to get to a balanced budget in 10 years, as, as they promised, uh, the cuts are pretty draconian. Uh, and as, as long as the, the president believes that if you can force them to do that, you're going to win the argument. Because people don't want the specific programs cut. Right. The numbers simply don't work anymore. If you're not going to touch entitlements, which the Republicans now say they don't want to do, up to and including Trump, says he doesn't want to touch entitlements, and you're not going to touch the military, which they also say they don't want to do, you're only going to do this on discretionary spending. You're talking about 40% cuts the federal government across the board in order to balance this within 10 years. Right. And it's not just entitlements. You'd have to cut all border enforcement, uh, all the things that Republicans like would have to be cut too. Right. Right. So I don't, I don't see an easy path forward at all. Um, I think we all may want to reassess our August vacations a little bit. I'm sorry to, sorry to say that. 
That's it for this special edition of The Odd Years. Be sure to follow The Odd Pod on your favorite podcast platform. Those of you who would like to hear more from National Journal, please check for the link in The Odd Pod notes to subscribe to Jeff's weekly Sunday newsletter. To be first to get the latest on Cook Political Report race ratings and all of the analysis behind the ratings, be sure to subscribe to the Cook Political Report. This will also unlock special bonus content from the odd years and invitations to attend virtual briefings in our 2024 election series. Leave a review, and if you're a Cook Political Report subscriber, check out our exclusive bonus content, cookpolitical.com. See you next time at the odd years.